Well, welcome everyone to South Carolina Legal Services seventh annual Constitution Day Legal Forum. I'm Susan Ingalls. I'm the Consumer Law Unit Head at South Carolina Legal Services. I'll be talking about removing barriers to financial stability. We have our um, Employment Law Unit Head, Jack Cahoon, as well. And Tiffany Love, who is our lead Barriers to Employment attorney, also speaking with us today. And we're really excited to have uh, staff attorney Abby Shafroth from the National Consumer Law Center. She's the leader of their Criminal Justice Debt Project and the author of the report on criminal justice debt in the South. Hello, my name is Jack Cahoon. I'm head of the employment unit at South Carolina Legal Services. Today we're going to talk about pardons, which is an excellent tool to help people deal with uh, convictions in South Carolina state courts. So before we talk about pardons, let's talk a little bit about collateral consequences. Collateral consequences are the effects, the legal effects of having contact with the criminal justice system. In South Carolina, there are over 38,000 different legal consequences to having a uh, having contact with the criminal justice system, ranging from certain occupations that can be impossible or difficult to get into, to housing barriers to housing, to all kinds of different other things. Um, this is something you can you can view uh, the list of all the consequences of a conviction on, on a website that's maintained by the American Bar Association. It's a uh, ABA's Collateral Consequences database, which you'll find with the materials. Uh, now, collateral consequences that affect our clients are some very common ones. For example, SNAP benefits, food stamps. Uh, conviction, certain drug convictions can result in disqualification for food stamps, uh, which is a, that's an important benefit that, that, that can be closed to people with uh, certain types of convictions. Well, the good thing is that a pardon removes that barrier to access uh, for food security. Also, um, there's restrictions on temporary assistance for needy families uh, for certain types of convictions. Um, again, a pardon removes all those legal consequences of the conviction and can restore access to those important public benefits. Um, we also face, uh, we also have difficulties sometimes with our clients and their access to housing. Uh, particularly public housing or Section 8, there are sometimes restrictions based on certain types of convictions to, to that sort of housing assistance. Um, a pardon removes those barriers. So what do we mean when we talk about pardons? Well, a pardon means that an individual is fully forgiven from all the legal consequences of his or her crime and conviction, direct and collateral, including punishment, whether of imprisonment, money penalty or whatever else the law has provided. So when somebody's pardoned, they're forgiven all the legal consequences of their conviction. There's one exception to that, which is the obligation to register as a sex offender. Individuals who have a legal obligation to register as a sex offender are not removed from the registry because of a pardon. That, that's not, a, not covered by a pardon. But all the other legal con uh, consequences um, are removed when somebody gets a pardon. So let's talk about some little-known pardon facts. First off, a pardon doesn't remove the conviction from an individual's criminal record. That's an expungement. An expungement removes it from their record. A pardon changes how it shows up on their record. So instead of saying convicted, after an individual, after an individual gets a pardon, their record shows that that offense has been pardoned. Now, a pardon, if granted, um, pardons all convictions on that person's record, or at least all their South Carolina state convictions. So if somebody gets a pardon, it covers everything on their record in the state of South Carolina. People don't realize this, but the governor has nothing to do with the pardon process. Unlike other states, South Carolina has placed the responsibility for deciding who gets a pardon with an independent board that's um, chosen by the General Assembly. So oftentimes people will say, hey, I'm a, can I go talk to the governor about getting a pardon? Well, no, you don't talk to the governor. You, talk, you apply through the Board of Probations, Pardons, and Paroles. 
Now, a pardon is not necessary to register to vote or to vote. You automatically regain your right to vote once you're, you've, com you've satisfied your sentence, including completion of any term of probation, parole, or community supervision. So it may be that you can go and vote right now, register to vote right now. You don't necessarily need a pardon to be able to vote. Now, another little known fact about pardons is that almost 70% of pardon applications are approved in South Carolina. People don't realize that they actually have, a, depending on their case, a decent chance of getting a pardon in South Carolina. So uh, it can be a very useful tool for people that have items on their record. And, and it's very possible to get a pardon in this state. So how do you approve, apply for a pardon? Well, there's really three parts of a pardon application. There's the application form. There's written letters of support. You have to have three written letters of support, and there has to be a payment of an application fee. Before we get to that, let's talk about eligibility for a pardon. So the big picture with eligibility for a pardon is an, an, an individual has to be off of probation or has to have been on parole for at least five years and has to, has to have paid all their restitution that they may owe to be eligible for a pardon. If they've done those things, again, let's go over those again. Off of probation, or if they're on parole, been on parole for at least five years, and paid all restitution, then they're eligible to apply for a pardon. There's some other circumstances for individuals that to be eligible for a pardon as well. I'm not, they're outside of the scope of this presentation, but they often will involve, for example, an inmate who's got uh, serious health problems and some other circumstances. But for, for most people, if you've satisfied the state of South Carolina in terms of your time served, or you've been on parole for at least five years, and if you don't owe anything else in terms of uh, in, in terms of fines or fees or restitution, then you're eligible to apply for a pardon. So, let's, so a pardon application has three components, an application form, written letters of support, and payment of a $100 application fee. And I recommend people treat this process as a job, the biggest job application of their life. You're trying to make the best case that you can for why you should get a pardon. Now, a pardon, uh, the application is available at the website of the Department of Probation, Parole, and Pardon Services at www.dpps.sc.gov. And it's not really a very complicated application. It's really only one page front and back. But you want to do the best you can to fill this out completely and clearly and make your case when you apply for a pardon. So when you're looking at the pardon application, there's an important block near the top of the page uh, that, that lists your reason for requesting a pardon. This is where you want to explain why you think you should get a pardon. Now, a pardon is an act of grace. It's not a, a no one is, this is technically entitled to a pardon. So this is where you're explaining why this board should give, give you a pardon. Um, and really the focus should be on what's going on in your life now. This is not really an opportunity, the time to argue about what happened in the conviction, whether or not the conviction was fair, whether or not somebody else should have been convicted. That's all, for the most part, done at this point in the process. So at this point you're trying to show what's going on in your life now and why you should have a pardon now. So this is where you can explain. You can say see attached. If there's not enough space in this block on the form, you can say see attached. You can write out a letter explaining the basis for your request for a pardon. You can, you can talk about what your goals are in life, what you want to achieve. If there's a particular line of work you want to go into. If you want to talk about um, supporting your family or supporting your children, this is a good opportunity to, to discuss that. If you want to talk about what steps you've taken in your life to make sure that you don't fall in the same situation again, this is the opportunity to discuss that. So for example, let's say that you, um, your, your previous contact with the criminal justice system uh, involved some sort of drug or alcohol issue. You could discuss what steps you've taken to get treatment, um, and, or, if it, or if it involves some sort of mental illness issue. You can discuss what sort of steps you're now taking to 
get the help you need, uh, or if it was perhaps you were in a situation where you were in um, you you were with some friends that were um, making poor choices. Well, you could say, I found other friends who uh, helped me make better choices. Those are the types of things to discuss in this reason for requesting a pardon. You want to make a case that you have changed, that you are changed, that you're in a better situation, and you're more likely to be successful uh, with this pardon than you were in the past. There's a block on this application where you want to discuss, you have to list your addresses for the past five years. You want to be thorough and not leave anything out. And there's a block where you want to list all your employment for the past five years as well. And then there's also a block where you need to discuss um, all your South Carolina convictions. And so you want to be as thorough as possible. I recommend that you pull your SLED report from the Department of uh, the South Carolina um, Law Enforcement Division and list everything on there because you want to get a pardon for everything. And you also don't want to make it look like you're hiding anything. So you list everything out on your record because they're going to see it anyway, so you might as well be thorough. Um, there's a question on here about listing any pending charges. If you have pending charges, well, first off, it's probably a good idea to get those charges resolved before you apply for a pardon. Um, there's also a question about federal convictions. As we discussed, um, this, is, th this particular pardon process is focused on South Carolina state convictions, not federal convictions. So you'll have to list whether you have federal convictions, but you, there's a separate process through the U.S. Department of Justice and the President of the United States to seek pardon of U.S. federal convictions. That's not addressed in this presentation. And there's also a place to indicate whether you have out-of-state convictions. Again, this process won't pardon out-of-state convictions, but it will. But the uh, Department of Probation's Pardons and Paroles is going to see out-of-state convictions, and if you're, you want to be completely honest with them about what, you, what sort of contacts you've had with the criminal justice system in the past. And then there's probably one of the most important parts of this application, which is where you list, um, you list out three people who have written letters in support of your application for a pardon. So you're going to want to choose three people who you're not related to through um, blood or marriage who support your application for a pardon. They need to provide detailed letter about why they think you should have a pardon. So I, I recommend uh, if you have an employer, somebody you work for, a former boss, Maybe somebody you served in the military with would be good. Um, a religious leader, like a preacher or a priest, is a good person. It could be some. It could be a counselor. So if you if you got uh, substance abuse treatment, a counselor uh, that helped you through that, that can talk about how you complied with all the instructions, with all the treatment, um, that's an excellent person to write a letter in support of your application for a pardon. Uh, it, could, it could be a neighbor, it could be somebody who just knows you in the community, somebody that knows what kind of uh, volunteer work you do. It, any, there's not really any restriction other than it can't really be somebody that you're related to. And then um, after you've completed this application, you have, to ha you have to have to sign it in the presence of a notary public, and you submit it with uh, the application with the three letters of support and the $100 uh, filing fee. So it's actually cheaper than many categories of expungement. And, and that $100 covers the whole, you know, all, any, everything on your record. So it's not $100 per conviction or charge. It's everything on your record. And you submit it to the department for their consideration. Then your application goes to an investigator, and these are basically probation officers who go back and follow, follow up on the information you provided. They'll contact your, um, your witnesses, the people who support your application for a pardon. They'll contact uh, the victim. Of, uh, if your crime had a victim, they, that victim will receive notice of your application for a pardon. Um, and it, they'll create a report that then goes to the board. And you have to uh, convince five out of the seven members of the board that you should have this pardon. And the hearings are held in Columbia. Um, you definitely want to go to the hearing um, if you can because it's an opportunity for, for the board to look you in the eye, for you to explain in person why you should be pardoned, and you're, you probably will increase your chance of getting the pardon if you go in person. You can bring witnesses too. Uh, you can bring the, those three individuals who, who wrote letters on your behalf are welcome to come, or other people. I've seen people go with members of their church, with their employers. Um, it's just a, it's a good thing to uh, attend this hearing and go with a witness or two. 
Um, so if you can, if you uh, are successful, then five out of the seven of those uh, uh, of those board members will vote in support of your pardon right then on the spot. At least five, and then uh, the board will send you a certificate informing you officially that the pardon has been granted. And as we discussed, it will change the way the you, that your criminal record shows up on your SLED report, and it may open up uh, opportunities like, for example, state and local em employment. Uh, in local government or state government, um, it, it might improve your chances of getting a job um, in the private sector, um, and it could open up uh, occupational licenses you might not otherwise have been uh, been able to get. Like for example, if you wanted to become a uh, if you wanted to become a, a, a contract or get a contracting license or a business license or other things like that, and it will remove uh, some of the barriers to benefit programs. Like for example, as we discussed, food stamps. Um, or Section 8 housing, it can be very, very, very helpful. So let's talk a little bit about what the uh, about what an attorney, what their role is in this process. Now, the good thing about this process is you don't need an attorney necessarily. It really this board is focused on you as an individual and what kind of person you are. So you, no matter whether you have an attorney or not, um, they're focused on the strength of those letters that you got. Um, and whether or not, that when they look you in the, the eye, whether or not they think you're a changed person. So, it's, of course, it's always good to have an attorney look over the paperwork before you submit it, but really, this is about you. This is about you explaining to the board why you've changed and why you should get this pardon. So, pardons are a powerful tool to help clients who have served their time to regain their rights and open up new opportunities. Um, what I always recommend clients to do is, is if we can expunge things off the record that's really plan A so because then it goes away completely but for those things that can't be expunged or if, if the client can't afford all the expungement fees then sometimes it's good just to go straight into seeking a pardon and then basically you're setting yourself up for success as best as you can by removing these barriers to employment. Well, thank you very much for listening to this presentation I wish you the best of luck. If you would like the assistance of an attorney, you can contact South Carolina Legal Services. Uh, our intake number is 1-888-346-5592, or you can apply online at www.sclegal.org. Our services are free to eligible clients. Hi, my name is Jack Cahoon. I'm the head of the employment unit at South Carolina Legal Services. My colleague Tiffany Love and I will be discussing how to handle driver's license issues. So where do you start if you if you have if you're having driver's license issues, where do you start? Well, first off, you start by getting your driving record. This is necessary to know what is interfering with your driver's license. In South Carolina, you can do that by going to um, the website of the South Carolina Department of Motor Vehicles at www.scdmvonline.com. Cost is six dollars, or you can go in person to the local DMV office, or or apply by mail. You can also receive a free point summary through DMV's website. So if you've lost some points, or you think you may have lost some points because of the, because of tickets, you can look that up online for free. There's many different things you can. Uh, that can interfere with your ability to, to possess a driver's license. It could be uh, driving under the influence or driving under suspension. Uh, it could be child support non-payment. The uh, Department of Social Services has the authority to, to suspend driver's licenses for individuals who uh, are behind on their, on their child support. It could be an out-of-state ticket. It could be a ticket in a whole different state or different jurisdiction. Uh, and it could be unpaid fines or fees here in South Carolina. Well, there's really two phases of the process of dealing with uh, dri a driver's license issue. The first is how you handle the issue in court, and the other issue is how you handle the issue once it's gone to the Department of Motor Vehicles. I'm going to talk with you about how to handle the issue in court. Well, first off, it's always good to talk to an attorney prior to going to court. So if you haven't already done so and you have a court date, it's highly recommended you talk to an attorney. Um, if you can't afford an attorney, then sometimes people have to go and represent themselves in court. 
So let's talk about how to uh, how to deal with a ticket in court and leading up to the date of court. First off, make sure your license has your correct address. This is where important notices will be sent to. So oftentimes people don't update their addresses with, with the Department of Motor Vehicles after they move. And if you haven't updated your address on your driver's license, then it's, it's likely that notices will go out and you may not receive them. And you may miss important dates for appeals and deadlines. So, so make sure you have the correct address on your driver's license. Secondly, keep your ticket safe. It has important information, such as your court date and the, um, the officer who wrote the ticket and the charge. So hold on to that ticket. And perhaps most importantly, don't miss your court date. If, if you want to try to work something out or address the ticket or plead not guilty, you have to show up in court to do so. If the issue is something you can fix, like a suspended license, get it fixed before court and bring, your, uh, bring proof that you fixed it. So let's say you got, yeah, you got pulled over and you got a ticket for driving under suspension. Well, if you can get your, the Department of Motor Vehicles to remove that suspension before you go back to court, then many judges will uh, dismiss the, the driving under suspension charge. If you need more time to fix the problem, contact the court in advance and ask for more time. Many judges are willing to give you additional time if you ask in advance. So if, if it's something like resolving an issue with your driver's license prior to going to court on a driving under suspension, you, if you ask for more time, it's likely the court will give you that time and give you the chance to fix the, the issue. Now on your court date, dress like you're going to a job interview. That could be wearing a suit or at least, you know, slacks and a shirt. Um, good to avoid tank tops. Good to avoid shorts or very short skirts. Come to court early, if, especially if it's a court you've never been to before. Come early. Give yourself plenty of time to get there, to find parking, to get through security, to find the proper courtroom. Uh, it'll make things go much easier. Another good reason to come to court early is you may need to talk to court staff early or to talk to the officer that wrote the ticket early to try to work towards a resolution. So if you give yourself more time, you're more likely to get a positive outcome. Turn your cell phone off. If, you, if your phone rings during court, you may lose it. It may be confiscated or you may be fined or otherwise punished. Talk to the officer before court. You can ask the officer to rewrite the ticket for a lesser charge with fewer points or a lower fine. Sometimes officers will agree to reduce uh, to a reduced charge. So it's good to talk to the officer before court. And as we discussed, if you have fixed a problem, like you've straightened out your license and you're going to court now for the DUS, driving under suspension, don't plead guilty before letting the judge know you fixed it. If you plead guilty, then the judge can't do anything to help you, such as dismiss the charge. So uh, if you have the opportunity, if you resolve the issue, make sure that you go in, in front of the judge and let the judge know that. Ask for payment arrangements at every opportunity. So if, if you think it's going to be uh, difficult to pay the ticket, you can ask the clerk, you can ask the, the judge um, at trial, uh, or sometimes you can even, after trial, um, if, you, if you learn that you are going to have difficulty making the payments, ask the, the judge again to, to give you uh, payment, special payment arrangements. And when you do ask for special payment arrangements, be realistic about the time it'll take for you to pay. You don't want to ask for special payment arrangements that are too um, optimistic, that, that you end up not being able to pay on. So if it's going to take you more time, go ahead and ask for that up front. Bring proof of financial hardship. So if you, let's say for instance, you were recently let go from a job. If you bring um, the termination letter, that, that can show the judge the financial hardship of, of the ticket, of paying the full amount of the fine. Or let's say for instance, you have a medical problem. If you bring proof of the medical problem, that can help as well to show the judge that you can't pay all everything at once. And then after your court date, pay as agreed. If you think you'll miss a payment, let the court know in advance. You can get back in front of the judge to change the payment schedule. 
if you don't pay as agreed and don't make arrangements with the court, then you've got problems because then the notice will be sent to the DMV uh, that you haven't complied and then your license will be suspended. And some failure to pay, some types of failure to pay can result in a bench warrant, which causes even more problems because then if you're picked up by the police, they may arrest you. So, um, and moreover, courts can intercept your tax return to recover, un recover unpaid fines. So the, really the goal is to make, to not stick your head in the sand, to, to talk to the court staff and talk to the judge, let them know the circumstances before it's too late. If you do that at the time before trial, that's good. If you do it at trial, that, that's good. If you do it after trial, that's not as good as doing it at trial, but it's better than just ignoring it. Because if you ignore the ticket, if you don't pay as agreed, then you will likely lose your license, and then it gets much more difficult to straighten out. Now there's another tool that's available called a motion to reopen. And a motion to reopen is asking the court to reopen a conviction after the fact. Some judges are more receptive to this than others. It generally must be filed within 10 days of learning of the conviction, but sometimes it can be worth trying to file a motion to reopen even after 10 days have passed. It doesn't have to be any particular form, just a request to a judge to reconsider a conviction, a fine, or, or to set up a payment plan. It's good to make that request. It really ought to be made in writing to the court. And you should try then to get the court to schedule a hearing on your motion. So you might have to ask the clerk, hey, can you set this, this motion for a hearing? And that's your opportunity to get back in front of a judge and address the ticket. Try to either maybe get on a payment, get back on a payment plan, do something to try to keep your license from being suspended. So let's talk about the big picture. So the big picture is that you should do something. Don't just ignore a ticket. It'll only snowball and get worse. Show up. Show up to court. Again, don't ignore the ticket. Be realistic. If you think it's gonna take longer for you to come up with the money to pay the ticket, let the court know that. Come up with a payment plan that really will work for you to pay that ticket. Be prepared. Be prepared with documents you need to show your financial hardship um, or to defend your case. Make sure you have what you need when you go to court. And don't stick your head in the sand because if you, if you ignore a ticket, your license will likely be suspended and then it will be much harder to address the problem and get your license back. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to Tiffany Love for the next step in the process. So now, fixing the issue with the DMV. The DMV may have requirements for a reinstatement of your driver's license. Generally, that includes that $100 reinstatement fee or other fees that may be associated with um, a driving under suspension, SR22 insurance, which is also known as high-risk insurance, ADSAP, and even unpaid county property taxes. But there are programs to help, uh, such as payment plans, provisional driver's licenses, route-restricted driver's licenses, temporary alcohol licenses, and even ADSAP community service options. For a payment plan, the person must be a South Carolina resident, they must be at least 18 years old, have a current South Carolina driver's license, and have met all conditions for the reinstatement of the driver's license, with the exception of paying a fee. They may not have participated in a payment plan within the last 36 months. They have to owe at least $300 in fees. They have to have been suspended for a qualifying reason, and they may have no pending suspensions. So how do you enroll into a payment plan? You can enroll in a payment plan on the SCDMV's website, or you can even go into your local branch to enter into a payment plan. There is a $35 administrative fee, and then you also will need to pay 15% deposit of the total reinstatement fee, plus any daily fees that you may owe. You have to sign an agreement, pass any test required for reinstatement, pay any necessary fees for the test that you may have to take, and then once completed, you will receive a six-month driver's license. A six-month driver's license restores your full driving privileges. You can duplicate the license with the same expiration date as your original driver's license. It cannot be renewed, and it is also subject to suspension. If it is suspended while you are enrolled in the plan, your license will be suspended, and then all the remaining suspensions will be reactivated. 
the SCDMV will not refund any money that you have paid into the program. And then when that six month expires, you will not be allowed to drive until your regular license is reinstated. If you default on a payment plan, again, your license will expire. You won't be able to get a regular Class D driver's license until you have paid all fees. And if you don't pay, any remaining suspensions will be reactivated. For a provisional driver's license, the driving privileges must have been suspended for a first offense DUI or unlawful alcohol concentration. You have to have a valid South Carolina driver's license or be exempt. If the incident occurred before October 1st, 2014, you must have a blood alcohol concentration of 0.14 or less, and there may be no other suspensions after that DUI or DUAC suspension unless it was an implied consent or another alcohol violation that was obtained from that same incident. You must be enrolled in ADSAP and you must pay a $100 fee for a provisional driver's license. For a route restricted driver's license, you must be a U.S. citizen or have permanent resident alien status. You may drive from work to school, from school to work, to and from ADSAP, or to and from a court-ordered drug treatment program. It is valid for the length of your suspension, and the application may be found on SCDMV's website, or you may go into your local branch. The eligible suspensions for a route restricted license are accident judgments, alcohol violations, controlled substances, failure to stop for a blue light, false insurance certification, implied consent, and misrepresentation of identity. Generally, you can only get a route restricted license once. However, there is an exception for child support suspensions. To obtain a temporary alcohol license, you have to have filed for an administrative hearing and it must be for either an implied consent, an implied consent under 21, blood alcohol concentration of 0.15, blood alcohol concentration of 0.02 or more under 21. While the results are pending from your hearing, you may receive a temporary license for $100. You will be able to use that license until the SCDMV receives the results of your hearing. If the suspension is sustained or it continues to be in place, you must return that license back to the DMV. However, you may still be eligible for one of the other categories, such as a route restricted license. If the suspension is overturned, you must return the temporary alcohol license and apply for a regular license. There is also an ADSAP community service option. ADSAP is the Alcohol and Drug Safety Action Program. This is for traffic offenses that involve alcohol or drugs, and it often requires the completion of a substance abuse course. If you cannot afford the cost, you may be able to perform 50 hours of community services in lieu of the fees. And South Carolina Legal Services is a nonprofit law firm that provides free legal services to qualified individuals. So to apply for legal services, you may give us a call at 188-346-5592, or you may apply online for our services at www.sclegal.org. Hi, my name is Tiffany Love. I'm the Lead Barriers to Employment Attorney at South Carolina Legal Services, and I'll be talking about expungement of criminal records today. So what is a criminal record? A criminal record is data that is kept by the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED. The types of data that are found on an arrest report are arrest, dismissed charges, no pros charges, not guilty verdicts, and even convictions. These records are kept at the courthouse and they are also gathered by commercial databases. What are the effects of a criminal record? Uh, many employers check criminal records as part of the hiring process. A criminal record can be an obstacle when trying to obtain professional licensing, such if a person wants to become a CNA. Uh, many landlords check criminal records when deciding whether or not to rent to a tenant. Um, and a criminal record can even prevent an individual from, obtain, from obtaining public benefits such as SNAP benefits. How can you see what's on your criminal record? You can see what's on your criminal record through SLED's website at www.sled.sc.gov. It's $25 payable by credit card and the report will appear automatically. You can also mail in the application to SLED. Um, it's still $25 and you need to send an envelope, a self-addressed envelope to have the 
report mail back to you. You can also check the public index, which is free. You can get to the public index through the SC Courts website, or you can do a simple Google search of the public index, Richland County or whatever county your charges are in, and it will come up. Um, some local law enforcement offices will allow you to come in and have your fingerprints taken. If this is the case, this will bring up charges that are not only in South Carolina, but nationally. So what is an expungement? An expungement is the destruction of criminal records related to an arrest or a criminal conviction. All court records of the charge or conviction are destroyed and expunged charges and convictions are no longer reported on the person's sled report. Uh, they shouldn't be appearing anywhere and if they are, it's potential Fair Credit Reporting Act issue. The only agencies that will still have record of your expungement would be the solicitor's office and SLED. There are a few expungement myths that I kind of want to get out of the way before we get started. One is that felonies are not eligible for expungement. Generally, they are not. However, there are some instances where felonies can now be expunged. Um, another one is that convictions will disappear from your criminal record after 10 years. This is not true. Your criminal record is not a driving record, so they do remain on your SLED report until you have had them expunged. All misdemeanors are eligible for expungement. That's inaccurate. If fines have been paid, then the conviction is no longer on your report. This is not the case. Um, and you don't have a record because you did not serve jail time. That's also not the case. So now I'll get into the categories of expungements uh, within the state of South Carolina. First, we have non-convictions. Non-convictions are arrests and charges that do not result in a conviction. That's your dismissed charges, no pros charges, and not guilty verdicts. For charges that are disposed of in what I call little court for magistrate, municipal, or summary courts, you can request the expungement directly from those courts. If the charge was disposed of in fit court, which is general sessions, then you can request the expungement through the solicitor's office in the county where that conviction occurred. There is no fee to have a non-conviction removed from a person's record unless it was part of a plea deal. Then it's $250. There are diversion programs in the state of South Carolina that will allow a person to have the charges on their record expunged, such as pretrial intervention, alcohol education programs, traffic education programs. Some counties now have a homeless court, there are veteran courts, drug treatment courts. Um, these programs are not available in every county. However, they will assist a person in getting charges expunged that may not be otherwise eligible to have expunged. You only get one bite at the apple with a diversion program, so you have to complete the program in its entirety and pay your fees, and then you are eligible to have the charges expunged. The next category is fraudulent checks. A fraudulent check must be a first offense misdemeanor conviction. Generally, each fraudulent check is counted as a separate offense. However, the court will consider the expungement for a person with multiple warrants that were served at the same time. There must be no criminal conviction within one year from the date of that conviction. Possession charges are also eligible for expungement. It has to be conviction of a first offense, conviction of either simple possession of a controlled substance or unlawful possession of a prescription drug. You must wait three years with no other convictions after the completion of all sentencing, probation, and parole. Um, it's also applicable if you completed a conditional discharge and you successfully complied with the terms of a conditional discharge, you may have a simple possession charge removed. However, it's different than a regular simple possession where you wait three years with no other convictions. Once you complete a conditional discharge, you may apply for the expungement of that charge immediately. So the next category is still with the simple possession, but it's a first offense drug conviction. So now first offense convictions for possession with intent to distribute a controlled substance are eligible for expungement. The individual must wait 20 years with no other felony or drug convictions from the completion of all sentencing, probation, and parole. They may not obtain if criminal charges have been pending unless they have been pending for more than five years. They also may not obtain if a conditional discharge was received within five years uh, prior to the date of their arrest. And lastly, you may not obtain if uh, charges have been pending for 10 years if they were other drug convictions such as a controlled substance, unlawful possession of a prescription drug. 
general misdemeanors is the next category. Um, a general misdemeanor may be expunged if it is a crime not carrying a penalty of more than 30 days imprisonment or a $1,000 fine. It does not have to be a first offense and you may not have any further convictions within three years of the general misdemeanor. Also included in the general misdemeanor category are criminal domestic violence charges. Uh, criminal domestic violence can only be expunged if there were no other convictions within five years. And when I'm speaking of a criminal domestic violence charge, I'm talking of a CDB in the third. Uh, the conviction of traffic related offenses punishable only by fine or loss of points will not prevent you from getting the expungement of a CDB or any other charge that has a waiting period. Um, you can only get one expungement under the general misdemeanor type. So the next category is first offense youthful offenders. Um, it's a first offense conviction under the Youthful Offender Act. That's for individuals between the ages of 17 and 24. It includes offenses for which an individual received a youthful offender sentence at a single sentencing proceeding for offenses that were closely connected and arose out of the same incident. Uh, the charges may be considered as a, one offense and treated as one conviction for expungement purposes. So this allows a person to get multiple charges off of their record at one time if they were closely connected and rose out of the same incident. They may have no additional convictions for five years after the completion of their sentencing, including all probation and parole. Now, uh, since the expungement laws have changed in December of 2018, the Youthful Offender Act now applies to individuals who were convicted prior to June 2nd, 2010. If they could have been sentenced under the Youthful Offender Act, it wasn't a violent crime, they went five years with no other convictions after all sentencing, probation, and parole, they may apply retroactively for an expungement under the Youthful Offender Act. The next category is failure to stop for a blue light. That's conviction of a misdemeanor first offense, failure to stop motor vehicle for a blue light. There can be no additional convictions for three years after the completion of the sentence. Juvenile offenses are also eligible for expungement in the state of South Carolina. The court has the discretion whether or not to grant. The charge must be verified by DJJ and SLED that it is eligible for expungement. The person must have no prior conviction that would carry a maximum term of imprisonment of five years if an adult had committed the crime. The person must now be at least 18 years of age, have completed all sentencing, and had no later charges. No violent crimes are included in juvenile offenses, and any number of youthful offender sentences at a single sentencing proceeding for offenses that are closely connected and arose out of the same incident may be considered as one offense. So this is another category that allows a person to get multiple charges removed from their record as long as they're closely connected and arose out of a single sentence. Survivors of human trafficking. Uh, the person must be a victim of human trafficking. Their participation in the offense um, that they wish to be expunged must be a direct result of being a victim. It's helpful to have law enforcement corroboration and they also must be willing to corroborate with law enforcement. So how do you get an expungement? It's not necessary to hire an attorney to get an expungement. The solicitor's office processes all expungement applications. So the person will need to apply for the expungement in the county where their conviction occurred. For non-convictions that occurred in magistrate or municipal court, again, you would go directly to that court to apply for the expungement. Uh, the person completes the appropriate expungement application that is used by the solicitor's office in the county where that conviction occurred. There are multiple applications, so it is helpful to call your solicitor's office and speak with the expungement coordinator to find the appropriate application. So now I'll talk about expungement fees. Um, I spoke about expungement fees a little throughout the presentation. However, just to kind of give a general overview of the fees, for non-convictions, there is no fee unless it was part of a plea deal. For diversion programs, it's a total of $285 with $35 to the clerk of court and $250 to the solicitor's office. For the remaining um, categories that I've spoken of, it's $250 to the solicitor's office, $25 to SLED, 
and $35 to the clerk of court for a total of $310. The payments must be made to the solicitor's office in three separate money orders. Now some helpful tips when obtaining expungement. You may be asked to come to the solicitor's office and bring your driver's license and social security card. Some expungement coordinators require you to complete the application first and then they will send you a follow-up letter with the fees to be sent to their office. Not all offices require a disposition sheet, which is also known as a sentencing sheet, um, but it is helpful to obtain it anyway. You'll receive a signed order for the destruction of your arrest records within six to eight weeks after you have applied for your expungement. Thank you for listening. As I said before, it's not necessary to hire an attorney uh, to complete the expungement process. However, it is a very difficult process and can be very challenging and confusing if you're not exactly sure what is eligible or not. So to apply for legal services, you may give us a call at 1-888-346 5592 or you may apply online for our services at www.sclegal.org. So now I'll be talking about correcting errors on your SLED report. First, what is a SLED report? A SLED report is a document that includes data that is kept by South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED. Uh, the types of data that is found on that SLED report are your arrest, even if there were no convictions, dismissed charges, no pros charges, not guilty verdicts, and convictions. So how do you obtain your SLED report? There are a few ways you may obtain a SLED report through SLED's website at www.sled.sc.gov. It is $25 payable by credit card. You may also mail in the request to SLED. It's still $25 and you must include a self-addressed envelope to have the report sent back to you. The following information is needed to obtain a SLED report. SLED requires the following information, which is your name. Uh, your first name, you may just give your first initial. However, for your last name, there must be an exact match. Your date of birth and your social security number are also required. Some typical errors that may appear on your criminal record are the convictions does not belong to the person, the convictions are listed more than once, meaning they have the same warrant number, same disposition date and arrest date, uh, the arrest dates are inaccurate, or the dispositions are incorrect. This means that it says guilty when in fact it was a non-conviction. So if you're not certain that there is an error on your SLED report, there are a few things that you want to do before contacting SLED. First, you want to obtain your disposition sheet, which is also known as a sentencing sheet from the clerk of court or the magistrate in municipal court where your case was heard. Your disposition sheet is going to give you information that includes your arrest dates, your disposition dates, um, and even your court charges. If there is an error on your SLED report, SLED has an official process in place to allow you to challenge that error on your report. You would be required to get a copy of your fingerprints from your local law enforcement agency that's usually on a blue fingerprint card. You will need a picture ID to obtain your fingerprints from law enforcement as well as attach the picture ID to your challenge application. The charge that you are challenging must be for information obtained from a SLED report and not from any third-party background checking agencies. You must enclose a $25 check or money order with your request. A challenge packet can generally be found on SLED's website. However, you may also call SLED at 803-896-1443. While it's not necessary to hire an attorney to assist you with challenging an error on your SLED report, it is helpful and South Carolina Legal Services is a nonprofit law firm that provides free legal services to qualified individuals. So to apply for legal services, you may give us a call at 1-888-346-5592 or you may apply online for our services at www.sclegal.org. Hello, I'm Susan Ingalls, Senior Staff Attorney and Consumer Law Unit Head at South Carolina Legal Services. I'll be talking today about the financial challenges on re-entry into society after uh, being justice involved. 
So justice involved uh, individuals do face many challenges when they're re-entering society after incarceration. In fact, it's rare that they don't encounter any challenges to their financial stability. And what I'll be talking about is a toolkit from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau called Your Money, Your Goals, Focus on Reentry. And what this uh, toolkit does is to outline the various challenges that are faced and to provide tools that could be used by uh, service organizations or other individuals that may be available to help folks when they come out of jail. It specifically addresses criminal justice debt and other items that are specific to um, justice involved individuals. Now we'll be talking about six goals when it comes to helping someone with their financial challenges. And you really don't even have to wait until you're released from jail or prison. You can start when you're anticipating the time that you'll be out. And here's the six challenges, or the six goals. One is to identify financial challenges that a particular individual has to successfully transitioning back into society. Second, create goals and identify the steps to achieve them. Third, obtain documents related to identification to help ease that transition process. Four, to identify and prioritize debt and specifically the two that are faced by um, justice involved individuals are criminal justice debt such as fines and fees and restitution but also consumer debt. Uh, five, access and review credit reports and background screening reports. That's going to be a very important goal to have. And then finally, sixth is understanding your rights, your individual rights to obtain and review criminal background screening records during the employment application process. So first, in the um, toolkit, we look at having the money conversation. And the, the toolkit has something called My Money Picture Worksheet. This worksheet helps the individual to assess their financial goals and challenges. The topics um, specific to someone who's been justice involved uh, are listed there, some that aren't on a typical financial um, money picture worksheet. And then you can use that checklist or that worksheet to focus on a particular person's financial situation as they're coming out of jail or prison. For example, Not everyone will have things like fines and fees and restitution. So when you're thinking about all the different debt challenges that you may have as you come out of jail, you're also thinking about the income challenges that you will have. And those two really go together and intersect um, quite a lot in the uh, criminal situation as you're coming out of jail. And that's because when you're in jail, uh, quite often, you know, obviously you can't work a job, but also if your uh, income involves um, public benefits such as Social Security, uh, disability, or SSI, those are um, suspended while you're in jail. And in some cases, depending on the length of time, some benefits can be terminated altogether and then you're faced with having to reapply for them. And so some of the actual challenges that you, challenges that you may have debt-wise, um, along with the income challenges, are, um, again, you may have some restitution that you have to start paying when you come out. 
And so all of those things have to be considered when you're looking at your money picture. And in particular, um, you're going to want to prioritize those debts. And, and that's uh, part of the toolkit as well that we'll talk about in a minute because of course the um, criminal justice related debt is the most important because that can you know often land you back in jail if you don't address it. So number two is creating goals and identifying the steps to achieve them. And um, within the toolkit is a setting goals worksheet. And it's a great, a very handy little tool because uh, most people, they want to set goals. They just may not even know it until they have something like one of these worksheets to help them go through it. And you can help them walk through it um, if you're uh, assisting them with their financial situation. The setting goals worksheets <clears throat> addresses short-term short goals, long-term goals, and in particular um, goals that are going to be what we call SMART goals, which you may have heard of. They need to be specific, measurable, able to be reached, relevant, and time-bound. So this is a way that you can help people. Not that Everything can't be done all at once right when you walk out the doors. Um, and that's why setting goals is so important. And that's also why I think it's a good idea to start this process early, even before release. The second, uh, excuse me, the third goal is to obtain the documents that are related to your identification, uh, because that will also help ease the transition process. You know, sometimes when you uh, are incarcerated, you have no idea where some of these documents are, such as your social security card, your birth certificate, or identification of some sort, health insurance card, those sorts of things. And in the toolkit from the Your Money, Your Goals um, program, there's a documents and identification checklist. And it specifically deals with um, not only how to get copies of the typical things that I just mentioned, but also things like your criminal records and, um, you know, proof of residency, even a green card, um, medical records, immunization, all those things that are going to come up when you're applying for a job and so forth. So that's a great checklist that's available and at the end of this presentation I'll provide you with all the information on how to access the toolkit online and it's a down free downloadable toolkit uh, and also some of it can be ordered as an actual PDF or a booklet. Um, the fourth goal is to identify and prioritize debt, which I've already mentioned, the two types. One, sort of the criminal justice related debt, and then two, the consumer, regular consumer debt that you have. Um, as far as the criminal justice debt, obviously high priority. Um, and as you use the worksheet that's available for tracking your debt, uh, in the toolkit, uh, you'll see that there are um, four different parts of how to track your debt. One is who do you owe the debt to? Two is how much do you owe totally on that debt? How much can you afford to pay each month? And that's part of your whole income and expense budget that will have to be dealt with. But the fourth thing which is important, what could happen if you don't pay this debt? And for a justice involved individual, number one is reincarceration. Re Will that happen if you don't pay this debt? Or repossession, for example, of an automobile or other vehicle 
that you need to get to work if you've been able to get employment. So this worksheet um, is really crucial, I think, to addressing the financial stability that a person's going to have when they come out of jail or prison because you make sure to prioritize what's important. Um, staying out of jail, getting to a job, keeping a roof over your head, and you know, paying the debts that really matter. Um, it's always important when you're um, determining the debts that you have to think about debts that are secured and debts that are unsecured. Because quite often, the unsecured debts, which don't have any collateral with them, like a car or a home, uh, household goods, or anything like that, those secured debts, the item can be repossessed. But with unsecured debt, like credit cards uh, or medical debt, personal loans, and things like that, those debts aren't going to cause you to lose your transportation lose the roof over your head. And so sometimes those need to be looked at as a much lower priority. And the individual is only gonna have a certain amount of income uh, per month to address all the debts that they have. So it's so important to prioritize. Number five is uh, to access and review credit reports and other background reports. Credit reports are always important because you're probably going to um, need to access some credit when you come out, but also the background screening is equally important when it comes to applying for a job because most employers now um, are going to uh, ask to review your credit report and they also will do background screening and there are things that are going to come up uh, during that. And so in the toolkit, there's a credit report review checklist, and it just ticks off all the things that you need to look at when you're reviewing your credit report. So it's important to make sure that um, everything on there is actually attributable to you, and also that it's actually a real debt of yours. Uh, sometimes there are things like um, it's someone else's debt, but it's under your name. There can be um, a name that's similar to yours and that person's debt is there. Or it could just be a debt that should come off of your credit report altogether. And so it's important to look at that. And in the toolkit, um, it even includes important information about how to dispute anything that needs to be disputed so that that can come off of your credit report as well. Now. Um, the, the way to check that credit report is to go to annualcreditreport.com and that is a free download of your credit report and it's really important to use that one instead of the ones that um, you have to pay for because that will give you a really good um, insight into what's on that credit report and what you might need to address. Now. Um, also, background screening reports, um, in, included in that, uh, and included in the whole credit report um, category, are um, landlords can get a background check on your history as a tenant, as far as paying rent and things like that. And we do see a lot of problems with those because sometimes landlords will report that money is owed, or they'll report that you were evicted, and unless there was an actual eviction case in court, or unless a court determined that you owed something, um, then you, you really can have a lot of mistakes in that area. And you may say, well, I don't owe anything. They may say you do, but if a court never decided that, then they cannot report that as being something that you owe. So all of those are important, and again, in the, in the toolkit, there's, in particular on the background screening reports, there's important information. Um, spe you know, special rules apply when an employer is using these consumer reports for um, employment purposes because it can, as I've said, include information about your credit history, your criminal record, 
public records and information about your employment and your rental history. If there's negative information, you need to be prepared to explain it. So having that ahead of time um, is crucial. If you don't know what background screening company is going to be used by an employer, um, the toolkit outlines your rights when it comes to that because you do have the right to get those reports and review them when an employer has um, used them in the employment application process. And that's our number six goal, is to make sure that a justice-involved individual that's going to be looking for work and having all their background checked knows what the rules are there and knows that they're entitled to um, uh, some, they have some specific rights when it comes to that. For example, they're entitled to, under federal law, prior notice. So the employer has to tell the person that they might use the information on the report when they get permission to use it. And that is the prior written consent that's required. They have to get your written consent in order to get the report. So you'll know if an employer is uh, doing a background check on you. And then the third item just to mention on that is the pre-adverse action. And that is just that the employer, uh, before taking any adverse action, must give you a copy of the report and allow you to address um, anything that's on there. And included in that is giving you a summary of your rights when it comes to um, that, that background report. So the back, background screening report checklist that's contained in the Your Money, Your Goals Reentry Toolkit, um, you can see on your screen, it uh, has some important information about possible errors in a background screening report. And <clears throat> it goes through the process of how you can dispute those, just like you can dispute uh, items that are improperly on your credit report. So these are all great tools to use when you're helping, uh, when you're helping yourself, of course, but if you're helping uh, just as involved individuals as part of your job, uh, serving them, then this toolkit is a great item to be using to get them uh, everything that they need from a financial standpoint to get back into society and kind of address those financial challenges. And just a couple of other things that I wanted to mention, and, and one is that we talk a lot about identity theft, and identity, uh, protecting your identity as a um, justice involved individual is just as important as it is for anyone who has not been in jail or in prison. So <clears throat> it's important. Uh, there are some particular tips for um, identity theft and fraud for justice involved individuals and you find those in the toolkit as well. Okay. And finally I just want to talk about the tools that are also in some of these modules in the toolkit that help with managing money. Those are things like um, saving for emergencies, uh, tracking and managing those income and benefits that we talked about, paying bills and other expenses, and just getting through the month. These are all great tools that everyone should use when they're uh, just sort of reviewing their financial situation. And if you use these tools for particular things or for just your finances in general, um, you'll definitely find that you're gonna be much more financially stable as time goes on. So that's all I have for now. I do invite you to go to our website because we um, do have some links to YouTube videos that we have for people who've actually gone through this program and so you can find out a little bit more there and of course go to consumerfinance.gov which is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau which puts out the Your Money Your Goals Toolkit and you'll see um, that information here at the end of the presentation on the final slide. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Abby Shafroth, and I'm an attorney with the National Consumer Law Center. Today, I'm going to talk to you about why current criminal justice debt practices 
are problematic, and I'm going to lay out several policy recommendations for reform. I'll be highlighting information from our recent primer on criminal justice debt in the South. The primer goes into more detail and includes additional recommendations for reform, so I encourage you to check it out. The primer is available on our website at nclc.org. It's available if you navigate to our criminal justice issue page, along with other resources and materials we've developed on criminal justice debt. Today, I'm also going to highlight other helpful resources on criminal justice debt reform for advocates and policymakers alike. Finally, after talking about potential policy reforms, I'm going to encourage legal aid attorneys in particular to get involved in providing representation to individuals struggling with criminal justice debt, and I'll flag resources for providing such representation. But first things first, what is criminal justice debt? Criminal justice debt is also known as court debt, fines and fees, LFOs, or legal financial obligations, monetary sanctions. These are a bunch of catch-all terms that get at the same thing. Financial obligations imposed as a result of interactions with our justice system. They are typically imposed on someone who's accused of a civil infraction, a misdemeanor, or felony, and include traffic violations. Sometimes criminal justice debt is imposed on people with no convictions or sentences at all. For example, court costs, probation or supervision, pre-trial pre supervision fees. There are a number of different types of things that all get lumped into the category of court debt or criminal justice debt. And so I'm going to take a moment just to break them down a bit. First, fines. These are what we think of as uh, most often, and these are intended to be punishment or penalties for violating the law. For example, a traffic ticket where you're charged $75 for going above the speed limit. That's intended to punish you for, for going above the speed limit. But then there are an assortment of other types of, of oblig obligations that are often added on top of fines. So user fees or costs are imposed on defendants as a way for governments or third parties, such as private probation companies, to recover costs associated with prosecuting or punishing defendants or to otherwise fund the operational costs of the criminal justice system. These user fees and costs are sometimes even applied to people who are acquitted or never convicted. Uh, so booking fees, jury fees, indigent defense counsel fees, supervision fees, these are all examples of fees. Surcharges are basically random add-ons imposed as taxes atop, atop of fines on criminal defendants. For example, there are some states that charge that apply a surcharge on top of any fine of, say, an additional 10 or 20 percent for a state's clean election fund or even for a judicial retirement fund. Restitution is typically thought of as compensation for a victim for losses suffered as a result of a crime. However, restitution can mean different things, and sometimes it's paid to a government, not to a crime victim at all. Finally, there are later add-ons, such as interest, collection costs, late payment penalties, and costs associated with accessing or using a payment plan. These are all additional costs that commonly accrue when people are unable to pay off criminal justice debt immediately. And I highlighted here that probation super fees, supervision fees um, may be an add-on that, that applies after, uh, after the initial fines and fees, but is also considered a user fee. So these categories aren't, uh, aren't exclusive and they can be a bit overlapping. Today I'm going to focus on six key problems with, with current criminal justice debt policies before getting into what we can do to address them. The first problem is that criminal justice debt is an unaffordable burden on low-income families. Over the past 30 years, criminal justice debt has increased dramatically as states and counties have attempted to shift the costs of the growing criminal justice system, and often of government operations entirely, onto the accused. These amounts can be significant, even for minor infractions. For example, this itemized list here shows a breakdown of costs for a simple traffic citation in California. Although the traffic violation is only punished with a $100 fine, that's what's meant to be the penalty, you can see how various fees and surcharges um, are, are added to that, at that amount to add up to an actual cost of the citation of nearly $500. 
Then it gets worse for those who are unable to pay immediately. Those who can't pay immediately may get hit with additional charges uh, for, for non-payment, or if they miss a hearing or don't know about it, they can be hit with additional charges for failure to, to appear. So this right here is how a $100 traffic ticket can easily spiral into an $800 debt. And the same thing happens across the board with criminal fines. Uh, for example, a, a small fine for marijuana possession can easily be multiplied with additional fees and surcharges into a several thousand dollar debt. These debts are simply affordable, unaffordable to many Americans. For example, in 2018, the Federal Reserve found that four in 10 adults would be in trouble if hit with a $400 emergency expense. They would have to go into debt, sell something, or simply wouldn't have a way to pay. Those with low income, less education, and people of color are even less likely to be able to pay a $400 emergency expense and to meet their necessary bills. The chart shown here shows that at every education level, black and Hispanic respondents reported greater difficulty in being able to pay a $400 emergency expense than, a white, expense, than, a, uh, than white respondents did. And of course, as, as you just saw, a $400 emergency expense would be quite common in the criminal justice debt space. Um, even a small $100 traffic ticket can easily become a, an over $400 surprise, surprise financial obligation because of fees and surcharges added on top. And unfortunately, it's poor people and people of color that are exactly the people who are most disproportionately hit with criminal justice debt. In fact, roughly four out of five criminal defendants are considered indigent, or too poor to hire their own lawyers. These are the people being assessed through these extra payments, which are used to, to fund government in the form of fines and fees. And it's not just the individuals accused of breaking the law who bear this financial burden. It's typically their families who should take on the debt. In a 2015 survey, 63% of respondents said that family members of defendants were the ones who took on the financial responsibility for paying off criminal justice debt, even though many of those family members reported that they couldn't afford to do so. The second related problem I want to focus on is how criminal justice debt traps people in poverty. Too often, methods used to collect criminal justice debt have the paradoxical effect of making it harder for those who owe to earn a living and thus to pay off the debt. In this way, they trap these individuals and their families into poverty. Examples of these perverse practices that trap people in debt and in poverty are suspending driver's licenses until a debt is paid off, which makes it impossible for someone to legally drive to work, for example, requiring frequent appearances at debt-related status hearings, which require people to take time off work and they may not be able to get the time off at all, or to miss job interview opportunities, subjecting people to arrest for non-payment, obviously that's a great way to lose your job, and precluding criminal record expungement until payment is made. As we know criminal background checks are a big barrier to um, accessing and keeping jobs, and so being unable to expunge your criminal record just simply because you can't afford to pay fines and fees is a huge barrier to employment. These practices all make it harder for people to get and, and to hold jobs and to achieve the financial stability they would need to be able to pay off fines and fees. Third, criminal justice debt criminalizes poverty and contributes to mass incarceration. Current criminal justice practices cause people to be locked up and separated from their families and their jobs simply because of their poverty. In all seven of the southern states that we looked at for this primer, including South Carolina, the law allows people to be incarcerated for failing to pay fines and fees, even when their original infraction could not have itself been punished with jail time. This is a picture of a woman named Tawanda Mershinda Brown, who's a single mother in South Carolina, along with her son. In 2016, Ms. Brown fell behind on payments towards fines and fees for traffic violations when her paychecks from her employer bounced and her son needed surgery. Ms. Brown was arrested and told she must pay over $1,900 immediately to avoid jail. She couldn't, she just didn't have that money so she was jailed for 57 days. 
While she was in jail, she was separated from her children, including her youngest, a 13-year-old, who she feared would be taken from her. She lost the new job that she'd just gotten before her arrest and that she hoped would create the financial stability she needed. And she fell even deeper in debt since she couldn't work but still had expenses to pay while she was in jail to take care of her family. On a more personal level, she also missed her 17-year-old's birthday and she spent her own birthday in jail. She wrote, there was simply no way I could pay and I didn't want my children to go without food, electricity, and rent. So for 57 days, I was locked away in jail, away from my family. I cried every day. Ms. Brown is currently challenging Lexington County, South Carolina's practice of arresting and jailing poor people for debt without providing assistance of counsel first and or considering ability to pay or alternatives to jail as, as an enforcement mechanism for non-payment. But she's hardly alone. Her experience is, is echoed by thousands and thousands of Americans and across South Carolina and across the country. Number four, criminal justice debt deepens the racial wealth gap. Low-income communities of color disproportionately bear the cost of criminal justice debt. And there are a couple compounding problems that contribute to this. First, there are disparities in law enforcement. There are known racial disparities throughout our policing and criminal justice systems. And in, in addition, there's growing, there is growing evidence that communities of color and especially African-American communities are disproportionately targeted for enforcement of the minor crimes and infractions that generate fines and fees. Second, there's, long, there's a long-standing racial wealth gap, which means that black and Latino families have less wealth to draw upon than white families when hit with unexpected fines and fees, resulting in snowballing costs and consequences for families that can't immediately pay off these obligations. As a result of this targeting and the uh, racial wealth gap creating less wealth to pay off surprise fines and fees, criminal justice debt perpetuates and worsens the racial wealth gap. Fifth, criminal justice debt impedes public safety. As states and counties have increasingly tried to fund government operations using fines and fees, the pressure on police to impose and collect criminal justice debt has distorted their focus away from protection of public safety. As one police chief explained, unlike 30 years ago, when police work was never about revenue enhancement, the reality nowadays is that police have to focus on production of revenues. As a result, police increasingly end up compromising their focus on preventing and investigating violent crime in favor of pursuing the type of revenue generating law enforcement, like giving out tickets uh, and arresting people with warrants for non-payments and dealing with people who are driving on licenses that are suspended with debt. This certainly, this obviously doesn't help anyone. Um, it hurts the communities that, that need, need police to be focusing on public safety and protection. It degrades the trust between communities and police officers and police don't like it either. Sixth, criminal justice debt costs everyone. While the harm of criminal justice debt is obviously felt most acutely by the individuals and their families most burdened with by the debts, maintaining this system imposes costs on all of us. For example, a study of New Orleans found that in 2015, the city spent considerably more detaining people who could not afford to pay criminal justice debts in jail than it actually collected from them. So this system designed to collect, collect money from people and to provide revenues was actually costing the city more than it was taking in. Criminal justice debt also cost local, state, and our national economy by shutting people out of the labor market. These various practices that I've that I've discussed create barriers to either finding a job or keeping a job if you already have one and, and, and cost our national economy hugely. Finally, as I mentioned before, criminal justice debt and the practices around it erode trust in and the integrity of our justice system. There are many people who now believe we have a two-tiered system of justice, one for the rich people and one for the poor people. 
And this, this breaking down of our belief in the system hurts all of us. So, given these problems, what should we do? The primer on criminal justice debt that I, that I highlighted before details a number of potential policy forms, reforms and provides a lot more detail than I have time to go into today, today, but I do want to briefly touch on them. I've grouped these policy reforms into four buckets. First, reforms to laws that create the unaffordable fines and fees in the first place. This is obviously a great starting place. If we can get rid of unaffordable fines and fees in the first place, that solves a lot of problems. So how do we do that? For one thing, we need to start funding courts and law enforcement from general revenues, not from fines and fees. When courts and law enforcement are, rely on fines and fees for their funding, that creates conflicts of interest. It creates a cycle where heavier and heavier fines and fees are levied. Uh, just so that the courts and law enforcement are able to continue operating. We don't have to do that. We didn't always fund our courts and law enforcement this way, and we don't have to going forward. Relatedly, we should limit the contribution of fine and fees revenues to local operating budgets. So we've probably all heard stories of counties that, uh, that set up um, uh, traffic traps, speed, speed traps, so that they can collect lots of, um, of speeding tickets fines and fees uh, because they need it they need it as a key part of their their revenues um, they're not relying as much on, on on tax revenues and they're they're looking instead to fines and fees but this is a problem as I mentioned before the fines and fees too often are imposed on the people least able to afford them and it's also not how our taxation and revenue system is supposed to work we're supposed to use use legislation and thoughtful policy making to decide how we want to raise revenues and how to spend them. So one reform is ensuring that there's a cap on how much fines and fees revenues can be, uh, what percentage of local operating budgets they, they, can, they can be, and otherwise fines and fees revenues beyond that would have to go to a state general fund. Additional reforms um, to address the problem of unaffordable fines and fees in the first place include just simply eliminating all the fees, costs, and surcharges that aren't intended to be penalties. Uh, we know that these, that these fees, costs, and surcharges, they're not supposed to punish people, but they do, and they especially punish poor people. Um, if, if, this, if the legislature and policymakers believe that people should be punished with monetary sanctions, they should do that clearly with fines and not hide additional punishment in fees and costs. And again, recognizing that these fees, costs, and surcharges are really just regressive taxes on those least able to afford them. Uh, we should cut them out and again, rely on other sources to fund our justice system. If we don't eliminate fees, costs, and surcharges entirely for everyone, they should at minimum be eliminated for those for whom the cost would impose financial hardship. Second, if states use, decide to use fines to punish people, states and, and counties, then they should tailor each of those fines to someone's ability to pay before imposing them and consider alternatives to fines. Fines should be proportionate so that uh, a, a fine on someone who is low income isn't devastating, whereas a fine on someone who's high, high income is a mere slap on the wrist. To be effective and fair, fines should be appropriately tailored to each individual's financial circumstances. Second, assuming that we retain a system that uses fines and or fees, we should make repayment easier. We can do this by making repayment rights and options clear and accessible so that people who owe debt know what they owe, know how to repay it, and know what they can do, what their options are when they, uh, if they have trouble paying, making a payment. We should ensure access to reasonable and affordable payment plans, ideally plans that have forgiveness so that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We do this with student loan debt. We should do this with criminal justice debt. And we should ensure that criminal justice debt can be waived, reduced, or payments modified over time. Uh, so that when people's circumstances change or if they, you know, keep reporting, I'm still unable to pay this, Your Honor, 
that there's an option to, to get them out from under that burden um, or to otherwise uh, make a plan, revise a plan so that someone can, has a chance, of, a real chance of success. This shouldn't be a lifelong sentence. And we should end penalties on those who are unable to pay in full or during periods of financial hardship. As we saw before, a lot of the costs, heavy costs of criminal justice debt uh, arise when people aren't able to pay immediately in full and they get hit with additional monitoring charges, interest charges, collection costs. These are all ways that the, that the price of, of fines and fees becomes even higher for those who are poorest. That should end. We don't have to do that. We don't have to charge interest. We don't have to tack on collection costs. And there are many models outside of the criminal justice debt space that we can look to to see how to do this better. Number three, we should ensure that collection policies foster successful reentry rather than erecting barriers. We do this by prioritizing rehabilitation over collection. Successful reentry and rehabilitation should be a key goal of the criminal justice system not revenue generation or revenue collection. And we should design our systems accordingly to make and, and check them against this, this sort of value threshold. Additionally, we should prohibit courts from penalizing people for non-payment unless they first conduct a meaningful ability to pay assessment. So obviously, it, it, uh, people shouldn't be put in jail for non-payment of a criminal justice debt, um, I, ideally at all, but 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 certainly there, as a constitutional matter, they shouldn't be put in, in jail unless the court has already conducted an ability to pay he, hearing and determined that that individual had the ability to pay but willfully chose not to make the payments. Uh, that's what the Constitution requires, but too, too often judges, judges and courts fail to conduct an inquiry or don't do a meaningful one. And this, this standard should go beyond um, should go beyond jailing people. We shouldn't be issuing arrest warrants. We shouldn't be suspending people's driver's licenses. Any of these, any of these severe penalties, um, without first making sure that the reason for someone's non-payment wasn't simply they couldn't afford to pay. We should also delink probation and debt. Currently, probation is often imposed, or extended, or revoked uh, because of someone's status with regard to criminal justice debt, and that doesn't make sense. Uh, we shouldn't be supervising people or, or throwing them back in jail merely because they're struggling to pay a debt. We should also make sure that debt isn't a barrier to fundamental rights and to, um, and to access to employment. So this includes ensuring that debt is not a barrier to driving, we need to end, end state policies that suspend driver's licenses when someone gets behind on criminal justice debt. That shouldn't be a barrier to expungement of the criminal record, uh, which is an essential step to, to getting to successful reentry and to job opportunities. And debt sh certainly shouldn't be a barrier to the right to vote. Uh, there's, there's litigation going on right now in Florida over this issue, uh, but I think we, we can all agree that someone's income and, and assets shouldn't determine whether they have access to the right to vote. Additionally, we should protect assets and benefits that families need for financial stability from collection. Someone shouldn't be forced to give up their last dollar to the state uh, or, or a car that they need in order to get to their job. And we should eliminate use of private collection agencies or probation companies that collect criminal justice debt and that often have perverse incentives to, uh, to collect more from individuals or to keep them under supervision longer, thus, thus growing the revenues for those companies at the expense of the individuals. And we should establish reasonable time limits on collection. Like I said, these debts shouldn't be a light sentence. There should come a point, as there are with other types of debts, where we wipe it clean and give someone a fresh start. Finally, we should use data to improve policies so we can make reforms that make sense. States should be collecting and publishing information about criminal justice debt 
so that advocates, researchers, and others can use it to inform the policy proposals and so that we know what's really working and where the problems are. Now, most of the reforms I've discussed are targeted at state legislatures, but courts can also be an important part of the reform process. This is a picture of South Carolina Supreme Court Chief Justice Beatty, who in 2017 advised South Carolina summary court judges that they were violating the Constitution when they sentenced people to jail for criminal justice debt non-payment without first providing them assistance of counsel. The Chief Justice directed the judges in a memo and in a mandatory training on what they must do before an individual can be jailed for non-payment and advised that when imposing a fine in the first place, courts should consider a defendant's ability to pay it. News reports after, after, the, after this directive and training said that many courts throughout the state immediately began suspending arrest warrants they'd already issued for non-payment and looking at ways that they needed to reform their court practices uh, to respect the Constitution and to comply with the, the Chief Justice's instructions. So courts can be a, an important part of the solution, and our primer identifies a number of actions that court leadership can take on their own without involving the legislature. This slide that I'm showing now includes, includes just a few of them, but like I said, there are, there are more examples in the primer, and if you find that you're engaging in policy reform advocacy and your state legislature is not receptive to, to reform right now, uh, look to your courts. Think about whether, whether they're uh, people with integrity and uh, who are in positions of power within the court system who can be allies and who can make change within the courts. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about um, policy reform resources. So in addition to the primer that I've, uh, I've drawn information from for this presentation, there are other resources available on our website on policy reform. We have, we have a, sort of a short version and the long version. So on the left side of your screen, you see um, the first page of our two-pager on what states can do about criminal justice debt. So if you want the real, real short version, there it is. Um, we also have on our website a more detailed guide for policy pr reform that was published by the Criminal Justice Policy Program at Harvard Law as part of our collaboration with them in 2016. Uh, and that's a great in-depth uh, guide for, for those working in policy reform. The Criminal Justice Policy Program also has a free web tool for researching and analyzing the laws on criminal justice debt in each of the 50 states. And um, it's, it's a great tool with tons of material. Uh, I do, I, I realize it can be um, uh, a lot of information, so I encourage you if you're, if you're looking at the tool and having a little trouble getting into it, um, to take a look at the National Consumer Law Center webinar on how to use the tool. It's available to watch anytime on NCLC's website and features um, a trainer from the Criminal Justice Policy Program. There are lots of other valuable resources out there, especially the Fines and Fees Justice Center, a new, new organization, has a wonderful clearinghouse um, that is searchable by state, topic, um, uh, and type of reform, litigation, all, all these sorts of things on their website. It's a wonderful new resource that we are grateful to have. NCLC has a webinar series um, on criminal justice debt with, that covers a number of different topics, including bankruptcy and criminal justice debt, ability to pay, affirmative litigation, and other topics. Uh, for those engaging in advocacy, there's a framework's brief on how to talk about fines and fees reform when engaging in advocacy and talks about effective messaging, uh, which, is, which is a short and wonderful read. The National Center for State Courts has a task force on fines, fees, and bail practices that, uh, that on their website collects a number of reports and resources from across the country on these issues. And in, the, in, in our own primer, we also list uh, state-specific reports in the seven states highlighted in, by the Casey Southern Partnership uh, to reduce debt. Um, and I, wanted to, I have an image here of a um, 2016 report focused on South Carolina in particular um, that helped spur some of the, some of the recent uh, advocacy in South Carolina and potentially helped, uh, helped spur the Chief Justice's um, training and directives on fines and fees in the state. Now, 
Finally, before I, before I close out today, I want to make a quick pitch to any legal aid attorneys watching this presentation to encourage you to get involved in providing representation to individuals with criminal justice debt. We can have wonderful policy reforms, but without attorneys on the ground enforcing the law and helping clients navigate the legal system, those reforms simply may not be meaningful. So we need you. There is a great need for more attorneys to provide no-cost criminal justice debt representation. An attorney can be invaluable in navigating the legal system and helping clients avoid the potentially devastating consequences of criminal justice debt that I talked about today. But too often, individuals don't have any representation in criminal justice debt matters. Often states don't appoint counsel in criminal justice matters, debt matters even when there's a right to counsel. And in many jurisdictions, the indigent defense system is simply underfunded and overwhelmed. They don't have capacity to take on this issue. Now, I know that legal aid has lots of uh, funding issue, funding and capacity issues of its own. Um, I'm, so I, I recognize and appreciate those, those barriers. Um, but there's a lot uh, that legal aid attorneys can do if they can get support and funding to do it. And there's, there's, there's good reason for legal aid attorneys to get involved here. Um, representing low-income clients who are struggling with criminal justice debt can support traditional legal aid concerns about access to justice, as well as financial stability and access to employment and housing. And some legal aid programs house their criminal justice debt work within a reentry or an employment or a consumer or a debt project. These are all places that it makes sense to do this work and it can be in fitting with work already done by a program. Now, there are restrictions for legal services corporation attorneys um, to who are interested in getting involved anywhere near sort of the criminal justice system, but I think too often it's read, people assume there's more of a blanket ban. There is not. There are a lot of opportunities for what legal services corporation funded attorneys can do in the criminal justice debt space. The National Legal Aid and Defender Association, or NLADA, has memos on permissible representation in the, these areas. Um, and I'll highlight a few, uh, a few types of advocacy um, that, that are likely permitted, uh, even for those with LSC constraints. These include post-conviction proceedings uh, or advice for clients not currently incarcerated, such as criminal justice debt remission hearings, where you're seeking to have a criminal justice debt um, eliminated or reduced, modification of a payment plan, defending against a driver's license suspension or against wage garnishment, seeking record expungement, uh, particularly where criminal justice debt is one of the barriers to expungement, and pursuing relief uh, from, from a criminal justice debt in bankruptcy. There are some, some types of criminal justice debts are, um, uh, are dischargeable in bankruptcy, some are not, and we have, uh, we have a whole webinar and materials on, on, on that issue, but it's another area where civil legal aid attorneys can really be helpful. Uh, in addition, matters that are defined by a state as criminal proceedings, but that are only punishable by fines where there's no possibility of incarceration, LSC attorneys can get involved there. And uh, when we're talking about juveniles, there are a lot of places where, uh, where fines and fees are assessed against people, against kids in the juvenile system, um, which is obviously very problematic, and this is another area where LSC attorneys can help. If you're interested in getting involved in litigation in this space, then there are lots of resources available to There are lots of resources, apologies, available um, available to help you do, do this work. And, uh, and NCLC has a litigation guide um, that discusses topics like defending against imposition of fines and fees, defending against collection practices, seeking remission and protections against garnishment, and relief through bankruptcy as well as affirmative claims. So that's a great resource publicly available on our website. We also um, have a collection actions 
treatise with a whole chapter on criminal justice debt that includes a lot of the material that's in the litigation guide and that'll be updated frequently um, over the years. So it'll have more up-to-date information available. Additionally, I wanna flag that this year, our, in November, we'll have our annual Consumer Rights Litigation Conference, and for the first time this year, we'll have a track on criminal justice from a consumer law perspective. Uh, so I encourage you to come out to that event. So, thank you. I'm gonna return to you for a moment and just thank you for your time today. There's obviously a lot of important work to do at both the policy and direct representation levels on criminal justice debt um, to protect against criminalization of poverty and to restore integrity to our justice system. So I hope you'll be a part of it. Thank you.